Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about something. I'm not going to talk about drones this year. I'm going to talk about something that is in the air and in the culture, and I think is actually responsible for a lot of the of what makes the maker movement uh, today. And that's not technology, but but a spirit. And that spirit, I think, started in the early '80s in the punk rock movement. Now, I was a um, I was a terrible student. Uh, I barely graduated from high school with a 1.8, failed out of college, failed out of college again, and spent my 20s um, as a bicycle messenger um, playing in punk rock bands. And I realize it's hard to believe now, um, but I, I actually used to be cool. Or more to the point, I was at a very cool moment. Um, and this was uh, the American punk rock movement of the 80s, um, followed on from the British Sex Pistols and all that of the, of the 70s, but was different about the American version of it in the DC straight edge hardcore scene, which I was part of, was a good example, um, is that it was, um, it was not just about the music and the spirit and the political aspects, but there was also a DIY element to it. And what I'd like to do by, after 10 slides, I've got 10 slides today, at the end of 10 slides, I hope to convince you that everything you see out here started in the punk movement, 25 years ago. So this, was the, uh, this is a book about the DC uh, punk scene, and, and I'm in it, but I just wanted to remind you what, what that scene looked like. This is not great music, but you will, you will recognize the energy. This, this is a minor threat. It goes on like this with a lot of stage diving, and, um, and that was the scene. Um, it, was, it was incredibly exciting. Um, we were playing in church basements. The reason it was straight edge and sort of anti-drug and anti-alcohol is we were all too young to drink. Um, and uh, that is me in the middle on the base, um, right there with, I, with hair. Uh, and uh, this is this, this, my particular story is that I was actually in two bands that went on to be successful, but not actually my bands. Um, the first band I was in was uh, uh, called, uh, embarrassingly enough, Youth Brigade, which uh, failed, and then later another band called Youth Brigade went on to be quite successful. And the next band I was in was called R.E.M. Yeah, um, I, I say that I used to be an R.E.M., and then I feel obliged to say a little bit more about it. Um, we, uh, the band we were in, um, was the toast of Washington, D.C. We were fantastic. We were doing our first album, and our manager tells us, before just the release of the first album, that there's this weird thing, that there's this other band called R.E.M., but that we should not worry about it because they're based in Athens, Georgia, and what could possibly come out of there? So they got in touch with the other manager, and the other manager said, you know what would be funny? Let's have a battle of the R.E.M.s, and the loser, the winner, gets to rename the loser. And uh, so we flipped a coin to see who was going to go first. And this is at the 9.30 Club in Washington, D.C., if any of you know that, uh, that, that place. So we, uh, we won the coin toss. We're the first um, to, to play. We just crushed it. Awesome set. We go to the bar to like, start drinking and celebrate our victory, the ownership of the REM name. And then these, these, these hicks from the sticks come on a stage. And their first song is Radio Free Europe, which you maybe you know was their first single. And like, we just sat there you know, with our jaws on the floor, the beer unfinished. And um, the outcome was pretty, pretty obvious at that point. Um, uh, Mike Mills, the bass player, stayed around just long enough after their victory to uh, rename us. He renamed us Egoslavia, under <laughs> which name we actually released our album. And that was the end of that, my brush with fame. Anyway, so that was, so that was me. And so what was exciting about this moment was that I got to see a movement start. And I think that everything I learned about the maker movement and everything that kind of informs my career today, in some sense, everything that allowed, let me kind of build drones, was learned right here in the 19, early 1980s. I'm going to walk through four enabling technologies of the punk rock movement that I think had direct parallels to the maker movement today. So the, the first was the TIAC Porta Studio four-track recorder. This thing was mind-blowing. So we know that the sort of the, the initial enabling technologies of rock and roll were 
the electric guitar, and the garage. So that was a given. But the four-track cassette recorder meant you didn't need a studio. It was, it was, it was a four-track recorder, so like, like the Beatles recorded on four-track, and it was on just regular cassettes. You didn't need reel-to-reel. -to -reel. It cost about $1,200. And I remember, you know, me and my bandmates in our group house saving up money so that we could get a Porta studio and record our own music. Now, that was really liberating because it, was, it lowered the barriers to entry. It was so cheap. You had your own. You could try mixing. You could try experimenting with overlaying tracks. Incredibly cool. And it has, in many ways, it has the parallels of the 3D printer today. It was a desktop studio. And the power of the word desktop is that it, it means you. It means regular people. It liberates you to make bad music or good music or, you know, free music or, you know, music at, at late at night. That was the first desktop studio. And that, I think, was responsible for a lot of the indie alternative um, um, albums that came out from that era and beyond. The second uh, technology was the sort of a technology, the um, vinyl printing plants, the record printing plants of, of that time had finally gotten to the point where they were relatively sophisticated, they had relatively automated processes, and they started to accept small batch orders. They would accept an order of 300 7-inch singles. And that was amazing. That, what that meant is you could record your, your album on your TIAC Porta Studio, and then have the tape sent to a mastering studio, which would do it for a couple hundred bucks, and that could be sent to a pressing plant, and you could get a box of your own records. Now, what was awesome about this is that, it, you know, as we know, the, you know, the garage electric guitar liberated people to make their own music and, and, and violate the norms of the, of the music industry, but it wasn't until you could complete the loop, go from creation to production, from the democratization of the desktop to the democratization of the actual pressing of the records, only then were we allowed to make music that didn't conform to the major label norms of the day. It was the combination of the two of them that allowed independent alternative music to emerge and to actually get out there. And rather than just being heard live, this was the first opportunity to let people, let people um, buy it. And today, the analogy is cloud manufacturing. Um, Every, you know, when you look at what's going on out here, all these prototypes, how do these prototypes become products? And the answer is you don't need to own your own factory anymore. You can now upload things to the cloud, to uh, services like Alibaba, and Chinese factories will do small batch production for you. And they take credit cards and PayPal. And it's very much that same access to the means of production that we saw with the, with the uh, vinyl plants accepting small batch orders in the 80s. Technology number three, the photocopier. This was huge. This is just when Kinko's came out. It was the first time regular people had access to photocopiers, and this was as explosive in its way as the web. What it meant is that you could make zines. You could, you could create your own media, your own content, your own magazine, and you could make them in small batches. You could go to, if you, you, know, if you needed to, you could borrow, you could go to the library and have access to a copier, but Kinko's allowed you to do small batch printing in you know, boxes and reams, and that allowed an alternative in the same way that you know, music now had, could, could uh, innovate outside of the norms of the major labels, now the content the zines, the, the media around the music could also innovate outside of the norms of, of big media. And that spirit, those zines became, became blogs, became social media, became the web. Zine culture is exactly what's around here. It's the celebration of the niche, of the long tail, if you will, of the weird, of the amateurish. It was all, it was all exactly what everyone out here would have been doing 25 years ago. And today, of course, it is, it is the web. The web has democratized media, and so anybody can reach audiences of billions. Back in those days, we could reach audiences of thousands, but the point is, access to the means of production was given to all. The next technology, if you will, was the, was the ability to turn it into a company. Um, the band uh, Minor Threat, which I uh, showed you earlier, turned into Fugazi, and then that crowd, that, those groups of musicians, created an indie label called Discord in Washington, D.C. And it was, it was a group house, essentially, but what it did is it used everything I just described, the photocopiers, the small batch pressing, the four-track cassette recorders, and turned them into a startup, into entrepreneurship, into a business that challenged the orthodoxy of the major labels at the time. And today we see this with Kickstarter. 
Those indie labels are today's Kickstarter projects. And, as, and, and everything they celebrated about being different, about not being for everybody, about being true to themselves, about building community, we now amplify, amplify a thousandfold on the web. But it's the same spirit, just with a wider audience. This is, this is what e-commerce looked like in those days. This is a catalog, um, and when I, was a, you know, when I was in this, 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 uh, this movement, we would get these, these, these catalogs of like, records and bands and singles and even cassettes of, of things we'd only heard about. You know, the, you know, so there was this legends of awesome bands, and you would get this in the mail, and then you would, you know, you would buy the, the singles, and they would come to you in mail order. And this spread through the grassroots and underground, and this became sort of what was cool. If you, you know, if you, this is the stuff that wasn't in Walmart, that wasn't in the, the record stores. And we would wait for these, these, these lists of albums and read about them and just treasure every word that described what was cool about them, imagining just what it might sound like. And then, then a couple weeks or months later, it might actually show up in the mail. This is what e-commerce looked like in those days. This is a... This is a Zen Records, one of the uh, small indie labels that came out of this. And um, I just love this, uh, this, I just found this on the internet, but I, I just love this. This is the delivery of um, some $3 for badges. This is how deep the fan affection was for this, how, how much people identified with this undercurrent, this subculture, this grassroots spirit. Um, it's uh, $3 for badges, 18 cents for tax, posters and handling, and then a credit of two cents is enclosed. Please print, it says, it says, and then handwritten from Zed, Jason, please print your full name and address on your order. Signed, Zed. I mean, that's, I, you know, I still see it in the, in the Kickstarter phenomena. When you look at the creators talking to the consumers in the comments and knowing them by name and this sense that there's people behind the products, that's what those indie it labels, and that's what the, the grassroots music scene represented in those days. There was, there was real people. This was not a faceless label. This wasn't a manufactured band. These are real people making real stuff. Finally, I just wanted to end on this last slide. If you need further evidence that the maker movement has its starts in, in punk rock, I give you Mark Fraunfelder. Um, and by the way, this is true for all the rest of the Boing Boing crowd, David and Shenny and, and, and everybody. They all came out of the punk rock scene from the 80s. But Mark has the particular, the particular sort of tri, you know, three legs of the stool, which is that he, Boing Boing, the site started as a zine in the 1980s and the 90s. Then, that same spirit was amplified on the web with Boing Boing, the blog and the website, and then he became editor of Make Magazine. So if you need, if you need sort of, you know, to complete, to connect the dots and complete the circle, I think Mark, Mark does it better than anybody. This, I give you, exhibit A on how the punk rock movement influenced and created today's maker movement. Thank you very much. Were you straight edge? I was straight edge. Hi, I very much enjoyed the talk. I, too, am straight edge. I'm going to stay straight edge my whole life, so kudos to you. I just have to ask, this is going to sound kind of cynical. Um, back in the early days, you talked about zines, and an, a certain effort was required for zines. Uh, and still, zines are made. I just went to a zine show a month and a half ago. I bought $40 worth of zines. Mm. But especially when it comes to the Internet, it's so easy now to get yeah. one's opinion out. Do you think that there's something of a, of a cliff that we can all just go over where it's just a cacophony of voices that yeah. doesn't really make any sense collectively? That's a great question. Uh, the question is, is, have we kind of over-democratized to the point that, um, that the independent voice is... Well, there was a little bit of a barrier to entry in those days. People actually had to write something. They had to photocopy it. They then had to put it in the mail. And those barriers to entry probably made them a little more thoughtful about the composition. And today, those barriers to entry have fallen dramatically. So my favorite... My favorite example of how people are trying to fight this is the fact that um, there is a... I mean, this is a slightly dated fact, but it's probably, it probably was true about two years ago. There was a sort of a secret vinyl pressing factory in Czechoslovakia, I think, that still made flexi-discs. Remember flexi-discs? The ones that would come in the magazine, you have to put like a penny on them so that they wouldn't bust. Apparently, there's one factory still in the world, in Czechoslovakia, 
that makes flexi discs, and there are bands so cool that they will only distribute the music on seven-inch flexi disc to ensure that it doesn't get out there in the MP3 world, and that you know if. You know that barrier to entry. Yet, you know, not only do you have to know about the band, and they only make like 300 of them. You have to know about the band, and you need to find some way to buy this this artifact. And only then can you preserve the integrity of the true grassroots. So that's a little bit um, over the top. Um, but uh, but I, I I do I do very much take your point, and um, I think I think it's a it's an acceptable loss. I think the fact that we do have the long tail, the fact that we can find voices, the fact that we do have network effects that that sort of bring quality to the top, um, means that I'm um, sure there's a lot of noise out, but there's so much more signal as well. And at this point, you know, word of mouth has never worked better in, in, in separating one from the other. So I sure there's noise, but I think it's easy to ignore these days. Every file that you've referenced is read only. And now we're dealing with all these files that are read-write. Yeah. And so how do we hack punk those files? And how do we take that ethic to people like Joey Hooty across the street and Quinn and all these kids who are coming up and make sure that that kind of democratized citizen stance of information moves from that read-only format to yeah. read-write? How do we do that? Well, I mean, I think I understand the thrust of your question. I mean, one of the big things that was really strong throughout all of this is that is that this movement, and I think the movement that continues, had sharing built in. They didn't stop you from recording uh, I mean, records. They didn't protect their copyright. They didn't take down MP3s. There was an instinct that if you gave things away, you'd get back more in return. And that, I think, became the web's culture, that you give things away instinctively and you get back more in return. This notion of protecting content of the, you know, the, the, the DRM, the sort of monetization, that sort of the, the, the tax on, on everything is a very corporate notion. And this represented just the opposite. Nobody was here to get rich. Nobody, you know, some of these labels did become successful, but that's not why they did it. They did it out of passion. And when, you, when you're motivated by this sense of this is like, I'm doing this because I'm part of a community. I'm, I, you know, of course the community gives back. Of course we listen. Of course we don't sue our customers. When you come out of a community, you end up with a natural read-write culture. And that, I think, is the difference between bottoms up and top down. The labels lost touch with their, the big labels lost touch with the community, and the indies kept touch with their community. And that's why I think that the maker movement is so exciting, because it offers a community-driven, bottoms-up alternative to, you know, big multinational corporate um, uh, models. And open source and creative commons and, and, and read-write is, is in the air here. It is, is absolutely pervasive, not because we belong to the church of the GPL, but because it works. We just, it's just, it's our culture. It, it's a no-brainer. Uh, 25 years ago, you were doing something. 25, it, yeah. now, you're doing something. There's people in this room who are like 18 years old, like you were in that picture. Yeah. And someone, on someone's smartphone today, there is a picture of them doing 3D printing. And in 25 years from now, it'll be 15 years from 1979. It will be 2039, uh, is that right? Okay. Somebody in the maker movement is going to get up in 25 years and give a talk just like yours, but they're going yeah. to be talking about today. What are they going to be talking about in Biology. 25 years? Biology. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, if you, if you ask me what's about 25 years from now, it's applying. So we've applied the world of culture to the world of digital everything. And we apply the, the world of digital everything to the world of physical atoms all around us. And I think the next thing is to apply it to nature. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take about 25 years before we harness the body. Nature is the ultimate factory, the ultimate machine. Um, but, you know, as much as I love 3D printers, nothing compares to the cell, the proteins, you know, DNA, these, the engines of biology. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's about the right time scale as well. My kids... Um, my kids are, are uh, my oldest kids are now freshmen, or freshmen and a sophomore in uh, Berkeley High, and they're learning synthetic biology as freshmen. They they uh, they take uh, they they order s uh, sequences, something called um, RFP, um, red fluorescent protein sequences, um, from gene synthesis laboratories on the internet. They then inject them into E. coli um, by shocking them, and they create it's not a new species, but it's something closer. That's a freshman in high school, a public high school in Berkeley right now. Next door, in our, one of our 
down the street is one of the synthetic biology pioneers who's got a gene synthesis machine in his basement. Gene, not gene sequencing, gene synthesis. This is not reading, this is writing biology. And that's now. Um, of course, it costs, you know, a million dollars and it's the size of the entire basement. But just when you think about where that's going to go, um, I know we talk a lot about biohacking and the biopunks, et cetera. It's still really early. We're in the dot matrix, if not earlier, phase of it right now. But 25 years from now, just imagine what will happen when we can work at the, at the molecular scale. Um, I think that same spirit will, will work equally well. I was actually just curious. I, I used to frequent the 930 Club in the early 80s. What year was this REM showdown? I think I might have been at the show. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say 83. Hmm. Well, does anyone know yeah. when REMs? We can probably Google this. Does anyone know when Radio Free Europe, the single, came out? It, I believe it was 81. 81? I think so. All right. Okay. Sure. Well, that was the year because it was, it was a month before that single oh. came out and destroyed my future in the music industry. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry about that, but, you know, I think you did all right, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You've been talking about uh, sort of this uh, ability of individuals to um, make an impact on some sort of information form or, um, you know, to, to be empowered to um, get their voice out into the world, and now we have this ability to collaborate more and more. Um, with that, we sort of have a, kind of like a... A, f a flat social structure that emerges with individuals themselves ex expressing in some way. Do you think, uh, do you have a, 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 uh, a sense of what collective decision-making processes mm -hmm. are most effective for uh, collaboration or that are yeah. evolving? Yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. So one of the things I, although I run a company, I'm actually much more engaged in the community, the open source, we, open source drone community where we do code, et cetera. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about the, what Tim, Tim O'Reilly calls the architecture of participation, which is how do you create a community that's effective? And um, to my utter amazement, so I went into open source, you know, five, ten years ago, whatever, thinking it was emergent and bottoms up and sort of it just kind of happened. And to my utter amazement, we've ended up with organizational structures and hierarchies that look more like GE than they do like a political rally. Um, the, you know, you have, we end up with leadership. A fundamentally great leadership is required. The more open, the more open-ended the structure, the more unstructured the organization, the more you need leaders and processes to, to you know, just make the trains run on time. And so we, you know, we actually, in a totally non-corporate, non-company environment, we have bosses, we have roles and responsibilities, we have teams, we have people get fired, they get hired. I mean, sort of quote fired, quote hired. We have code review, we have 360s, performance evaluations. It's, you know, amazingly, the more unstructured it is, the more we end up putting in place, I would call cost world-class corporate structure models to ensure that we can, in fact, bring in people from anywhere and have them succeed. I mean, one of the problems with open communities is that you can't hire, you can't sort of interview people and, you know, and then you know, check the references and make sure they went to the right schools and resume before you bring them in. Anybody can come in and it's a meritocracy. They earn their way to the top and they're all around the world and they come from different backgrounds and different cultures. And, and because it's so open-ended on the input side, you end up having to be very structured on the output side to, to make it successful. It's absolutely fascinating. I think I'm delighted we live on, at, on the shoulder, stand on the shoulders of 20 years of open source software. And now what you're seeing is those same models applying to, apply to hardware and, uh, you know, we, we worship of the, the Church of the Linux Foundation. Thank you very much. <laughs>